Hello, TalkHouse listeners. This is Josh Modell. Instead of a TalkHouse episode this week, I wanted to share another episode of my pal Craig Finn's show, That's How I Remember It, which is just starting its third season. Craig has an incredible array of guests lined up, and he's switching to a new schedule where he'll have new episodes every other week without a break. That means more amazing chats for you, including this one with phosphorescence Matthew Hauk. Craig and Matt chat about the philosophy behind That's How I Remember It. It's a podcast about creativity and memory, as well as an early meeting between the two, Phosphorescence Mighty Song for Zula, and much more. I'll be back next week with your regularly scheduled TalkHouse programming, but for now, please give That's How I Remember It your full attention. Craig Finn. This is my podcast. It's called That's How I Remember It. Each episode, I talk to a creative person about their work and how their memory affects the stories they tell others, as well as the stories they tell themselves. This episode, I'm honored to welcome Matthew Hauk of the band Phosphorescent. He's got an amazing new record out called Revelator. I've been spinning it constantly for the past month or two. We had a pretty great talk. I saw the band play later in the evening uh, after we spoke in Brooklyn. They sounded fantastic. I absolutely love Matthew's songs, and I think this new collection is just amazing. Also, the band he plays with is such a treat to watch. It's just such a cool sound. One thing we talked about here, uh, it was years ago I got asked to host some music coverage for IFC at South by Southwest. They had a house where a lot of bands played, and uh, they came in and I spoke to a ton of them. It was one of the first times I'd done an interview on this side of the microphone. And the first band they had come in that week was Phosphorescent, so Matthew was kind of my first interview. I remember being wildly overprepared. I had about four pages of questions that we didn't get to in a small window of time that we were allowed. Um, I still probably overprepare a bit, but better than the other way around. And I was thrilled to have Matthew Help from Phosphorescent back, back here to join me. Matthew Hauk, thank you for joining us. I'm going to start this out the way I start all these podcasts with the same question, which is this. Do you consider yourself to have a good memory? No. In life, no. Not a functional one. <laughs> well, how do you call It sounds like you qualify that. Do you, are yeah. there things you do think you have a good memory about? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I think I can remember, like, I'm really good at, like, remembering emotional, like, sort of, like, I don't know. I guess what I mean is things stick with me for a long time if they're in this like certain sort of zone, I think. But as far as like having any idea, you know, like what day it is or what, what I did last week or whatever, like, no. Yeah. How about like ephemera, like music stuff or whatever it is? Because a lot of musicians say they, they like, oh yeah, I know. I can remember that. Mm-hmm. In terms of music. <laughs> or I don't know, like r- r- songs. Yeah. No, that, yeah. that's what I'm talking about. I think actually maybe is, yeah, like. Yeah, like I can remember, you know, a song from when I was a tiny child, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I can remember the melody and remember the feeling and all that. But, but yeah, again, like the, the more useful aspects of memory are, are markedly bad. How about, how about <laughs> I mean, this is, this podcast is about memory. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, right. absolutely. Why is this your interest? You know, when I first started this podcast, I was coming off a record that I, my last solo record, which was called A Legacy of Rentals, which talked a lot about how we remember things and how we remember like people that are gone stories, you know, like, like how we kind of try to memorialize things almost Mm -hmm. like how we build monuments Mm -hmm. almost through songs and our art to things that, you know, people and places and stories that don't normally get monuments. You know, you walk into a park, you see a general on a horse, Mm -hmm. but you don't see like the dude who is your neighbor who, you know, Mm -hmm. taught you this thing. And so I was kind of thinking a lot about that. And then I started to think that, maybe a lot of artists, a lot of writers, you know, songwriters, writers, whatever, would say they have a very good memory because they're telling the right story. Right. You know, and that was my thesis going in and that was completely wrong. Cause I think 50, 50 people are like, no, but a lot of people sort of qualify it and say, 
say right. I, I have, I personally think I have a very good memory. Like I can remember conversations really mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And that makes me annoying to fight with if mm -hmm. you were like my partner, because I can be like, oh, you know, in yeah, June, 20, this, right? June 2020, June 2020, <laughs> you said this. Um, but so, but, but, you know, and then I, I think I got really interested in sort of the way we might build our own personal stories on memories that might be fuzzy mm. um, and our own interpretation of events. And there's a, in particular, there's a book called Night of the Gun by David Carr, where he was an addict and he goes and investigates him, his own, his own life, mm. where, which a part of his life that's very fuzzy to him. Going and back and used, trying to piece yeah. together like what was actually going and, on. And he, in the time between, he'd become an investigative reporter. So he kind of like went and investigated himself and found like wild inconsistencies in the stories. With, with what he had told himself yes. versus what was right, what it's, other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was super fascinating to me. Yeah. So that's kind of how we got here. But I'm wondering, how do you think, like, if you have a good emotional memory, how do you think it shows up in your work? Well, I guess, man, you know, I might have lied to you. Because the other, the as far as work is concerned, I feel like uh, like every time that I, even the, the basic building blocks of it, like if I write a song, uh, it's every time, it's like the first time I've ever fucking done it. You know what I mean? Like I don't, and that gets tenfold by the time it's recording and you know producing and making the sounds it's like it's a brand new thing every single time in a way that i don't know if it's a product of just how i work or if it's yeah m maybe i'm doing it wrong you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> or maybe i, I you have I, a new set of concerns each time you approach a thing so it's not the same thing anymore you know are you completing songs before you move on to the next one no or are they all in play at the same time yeah they're all in play until it generally takes like a, a theme to sort of emerge and then all of them can get finished within that umbrella like they have to like i need the reason the records the last three records at least have the titles that they have is because they're related to the song that sort of like encapsulated that so for example this this album revelator mm -hmm. when i wrote revelator all the other snippets of songs began to immediately sort of like fall into place do you know what i mean like i knew it's like oh i know now what I'm doing. Whereas before a single song is like trash in the wind or something, you know, I don't know. It's like, it's like, it doesn't, it disappears. Like, I don't know what it, I don't know what a song is. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that, I mean, that, that was something I was going to ask you and we can jump ahead to that. Cause I mean, revelator is, you know, it, it, it's about revealing. And I think that there's part, two parts of when I make a record, there's like the part I go in with a plan and the part that reveals itself to me. So you're talking about, you're kind of working towards that reveal. I think always like searching for it. Yeah. Cause I don't, I don't think I ever go in with a plan. Honestly, I think, uh, like, well, the, you know, again, it's like it's separated into these little stages, but I definitely never, I've never had a plan to sit down and write a song and know what I want to achieve within that song. Right. It's just kind of like loosely pawing at a feeling until something kind of starts coming up and then i mean you, you look and then you definitely have a goal when you're when you start to make a record you have an idea maybe of what it will sound like but but often you don't at least often i don't you just kind of start you know and like do you do you sit down and go to work i mean meaning like are you like, all right, today's the nerd, you know, this is my time when I go work on songs or is it like, oh, I've got an idea. A bit of both. I, the, the, here's the time where I write on songs kind of feeling is generally under like, uh, some sort of like duress. Like it's been, uh, ignored too long. You know what I mean? It's like, I was like, okay, I need to really focus on this thing. But the, the, the initial thing, yeah, is generally, it's weird. I've been talking a lot about this the last couple of weeks just because because of this process of of you know talking about a thing after you start you know you, well yeah it's what it is right but it's also weirdly i don't it feels a lot heavier than that it's like i wish i could be a little more like a politician about it where I like you know i'm here to stay on brand or like have a message you know what i mean have a thing but instead i end up caught up in these like it turns out that i start yeah like i start having to sort of like unpack this stuff that is hard to do you know like i don't know i don't know the answer to a lot of this stuff and then you start going well okay well what you know what is all this and yeah but no I, I feel like one of the things that i learned talking about this is that i find that when i do make that time 
for whatever reason that has to happen like this it's like time to finish these songs or whatever i'll try to i'll end up going and like sitting down and, and really putting in like you know real effort like a really like but nothing nothing works during that time frame in my experience it's like but you did that and then a couple of days later all of a sudden things start do you know what I mean? It's like you're like forcing antennas out of the ground that then start, pick, you know what I mean? That that feels like, it's weird. Like it never feels like I'm like the master of my, you know, like I'm writing this thing. It never feels like that. It feels like I don't, this is not happening. And then all of a sudden it goes, oh, like, ah, like that. Yeah, I think for me anyways, like filling up the page is the first, sort of the first part. And it's like, I've almost come to trust that that part's going to be bad mm -hmm. or, or uninspiring. And then- right. I can start moving stuff around. Right. And then it might vibrate. So you do that thing. You write, you just like go. No, I might, I wouldn't say like, not like a free write, but I might write kind of like, I, I know like there's like a saying, a friend of mine's a television writer and he always says, write the bad version first. Right. And it's like, yeah, write a song that you don't, like first, the first part is writing a song. Mm. And is it, is it a song you nef I necessarily want to share with people? Mm. No, it's not good yet. No. But then you can, but, but now that it's a song, I can start. To making like, it good yeah and yeah and it might even start in my case with like what's the worst line of the song right you know let's let's get rid of that and make it better do you do that yeah so you, you so you make you sort of right so it's kind of like drawing like you draw the rough shape mm -hmm. yeah and then you start yeah yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. then in in the last number of records i made with josh kaufman and you know when i brought it to him he's like oh no you no, know, really? and then, and yeah, and then we'll, and then we'll dig in on it. So it's so almost you do like, that. You, you, you feel comfortable at a certain point. You do feel comfortable share, or even earlier. Yeah, I, share, share. I share, I feel comfortable sharing with him, but then I, I also, but that's cause you'll have a special relationship. Yeah. Okay, and, right. But I know it's going to change. Right. Like, and I'm ready for that. And so how, wait, how rough of a state do you show? I mean, I'm like to? to the point where I'm like, I would get up at a coffee shop and play it, you know? And, okay, and, so it's, and, it's a but, song but it's just definitely a song yeah, yeah. and i'm like it's actually pretty good it's as good as i can get it right now but then you know he might be like look man yeah i think that that second first <laughs> you know and and right. it's great to have a relationship like yeah. that where you're like i'm uh, i'm comfortable with that and 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 i think that at you know at, at my age that and having written very many songs a lot of tunes at this point there's, yeah there's i know there's more coming right so you're not like dude we can't touch this one right you know you, you feel you feel pretty disposable is obviously the wrong word but, right but you feel you feel like right they're they're just tunes like i'm bringing can, raw materials right and you right. know and look if we screw it up i could always go out and play it you know the way i brought it in when i get on stage yeah you know yeah if oh, we you can up, make it worse you mean if in, if in yeah fact, if we screw yeah. up the recording or, you know if we we make it in a in a way that's like we don't like you know that i don't li end up liking later you know mm -hmm. do you have a first memory of music like hearing music that like music that moved you as a kid or something yeah i think i i think i do but yeah look i like that this podcast is about memory i i i, I don't know if it's true right you know what i mean i don't i i feel like but yeah, I have a I have a distinct memory of of uh, hearing. My heroes have always been cowboys. You know, Willie Nelson. It would have probably been on a. In my mind, it's in the in the back of my you know parents' car, and you know, like I, I made a record of Willie Nelson songs, kind of like it, a bit almost inspired by that moment. Honestly, was yeah, I mean that's a staggeringly sad song. It's so heavy, and you know the way it's produced is like just so sad <laughs> and so i do think in some ways it's like i wonder about that stuff where it's like yeah i, I don't know i don't know how much that like shaped me but it seems to i can see a, a line through still from that tune to like everything i you know do is is like in that realm of you know so was there music around your house like do your parents have music around just only you know well-known stuff you know I mean? yeah 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 very you know well, well known stuff yeah and then i didn't there wasn't a lot of music around my house like i yeah. was there were scraps and i would Glom gravitate it. to it yeah, you yeah. know like i know for me i always think you know like being interested in words like the records my few records my parents had that had the lyrics mm. on the back or in, and i would read along and that was like you know paul simon's greatest hits sure. the one that i was like wow those paul those, simon's still big for you yeah paul yeah. simon's really big it's for tremendous, me yeah. 
And and also in the in the sense as I get older, I always think that Paul Simon, you know, he got older and never looks silly. Yeah. You know, like where where like if you if you're if you're too much of a rock dude, you know, it, it, it gets weird if you're yeah. Vince Neal or whatever, you know. But Paul Simon like looks appropriate yeah. now, then always. Yeah. You know? to, yeah. Well he was kind of a grown up yeah. as a youngster as well, wasn't he? I also think that you know, like being from Minnesota and seeing like Paul Simon, he'd be one person that I look at and be like, I think that may be why I ended up in New York. Like, right. Like, I'm like, that That guy looks like kind of a cool, urbane dude that's right. like, that, that I could aspire to. He's not that tall. He's like, right. you know, sort of nerdy, but like people like him and he, he gets to do cool stuff. Right. Oh. So it was like a North Star for you <laughs> early on. But Dylan wasn't there? Dylan, Dylan was also, I've told this story on the, on the podcast before, but I had this really interesting thing with Dylan when I was a kid. Like I said, I didn't, I was looking for scraps of music mm-hmm. and someone told me that Bob Dylan had the best lyrics. Right. And, but my parents didn't have any Bob Dylan records. Yeah, neither, so neither. I heard Life's Been Good by Joe Walsh, you know, my Maserati mm-hmm. goes 185. Yeah, totally. And I heard that on the radio. I said, well, that's gotta be Bob Dylan. <laughs> So the lyrics are so yeah, good. Yeah, totally right. And this for must two be. years, I thought that was Bob Dylan. That's you great. Know, like I yeah. was like, well, that, that, that obviously he wrote that, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. jam. <laughs> How about like music that was? What was the music? Was there music that was like your own? Like kind of like aside from your parents? Like maybe when you were a teenager, was there something you got into that kind of like when you went deeper as a kid into yeah, stuff? I mean. Yeah, Bob Dylan, you know, honestly, okay. yeah. I mean, I, I I was lucky enough, I think, to come to come across that fairly early somehow. I don't really, I've I've tried mm-hmm. to figure out the the steps of how it all worked, but yeah, I mean, you know, like it was. I liked. I mean, I I was a kid. I was like the perfect age when like like Nirvana happened. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And so like that that and and so that that felt like you know, and it was it was it was a period where the mainstream music was much weirder and much, you know what I mean? And probably maybe detrimentally, I think, you know, like it's, there was some pretty heavy and weird songs going on out there that were just kind of like floated as regular yeah. culture, you know what I mean? I feel like that's a weird thing for a 13 year old to be, you know, like, anyway, that's neither here nor there, I guess. But I guess during all that, like I, so I guess I, I, for a while there, I trusted, I didn't have, like, I wasn't, I was, grew up in Alabama and like, there was no record store. Like I didn't have a, I had no knowledge of like the underground, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. at all. So, but within the, the mainstream, yeah, you know, I, I found Bob Dylan and found, Willie, you know, Willie Nelson and like, and definitely started kind of tracing that stuff back again, you know, it's pre-internet, like there's no, you're like things just weren't that easy to find you know what i mean yeah uh so anyways yeah that that's i dylan dylan i found bob dylan and and you know dove dove deeply into that there's a it's i mean i'm still diving now you yeah. know what i mean like yeah so well, that's a wonderful thing about dylan oh that kind of artist that that you know the older you get there's still it's infinite right he's still he's out there making music maybe tonight yeah that you can plug into you know <laughs> yeah i, that, I just saw him last week actually oh nice but yeah yeah it was, and it was amazing it's tremendous yeah. oh at the brooklyn bowl yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So i went to both of them yeah. Yeah, i went to two shows you know like the idea of growing up and things being out of print and stuff i remember when i was a kid i was i was like going to record stores i was plugged in but two older guys had told me you got to hear the mc5 oh right and their records were completely out of print and i remember like for years my sad walking into a record store and flipping to the M's, like going immediately to, to the to, M's. To hopefully hear what this and, thing this guy's told you about yeah, was, because you never still And it was it. never there. Right. It was never there. And it was just like, like there would be no rack for it. It would be like, but how am I going to hear this? Like, there's there's, there's just no way. If it's I not sitting there on the shelf, you're not hearing it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Kind of, it's beyond crazy to try to imagine that's how it was. One of the things I've asked uh, everyone on this is, do you connect music to seasons? Like, do you, do you, is there music that sounds better in the summer to you, winter, fall? Yeah, I think I probably do. Yeah, I think probably that's true. But also, I think more it's like like time of day kind of oh, thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like in particular to you know bring it back to myself, I guess. Like doing doing like this record, Revelator feels very, and maybe all of phosphorescent. Honestly, just has always felt like 
nighttime music you know, mm-hmm. in the way that probably most music does but i guess what i mean is doing the last couple couple weeks of like playing playing these songs at like noon at a radio station it, it feels <laughs> in, feels like an insane person like you know it's like this is an insane person's idea of what you might want to do at noon on a tuesday or whatever do you work at night do you work I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah is that yeah. when i try you know look i try i get i feel like i get inspired in the morning to try to like kind of like i think a lot of kernels of ideas happen in the morning yeah i get excited about something and then the day happens which is like kind of it's to me it's like a state that like is easily sort of dashed against the the rocks you know like it can be just shattered pretty easily yeah right so yeah and then i find that yeah i end up getting i can end up finding my way back into that space in the in the wee hours or whatever you know i have become uh, and not necessarily a, a more I guess I'm a morning person, but like I work in the morning almost exclusively because of what you're saying. Right. The because spark. at a certain point, well, the like or before the day has got you. Well, yeah. When when I drink coffee, my first cup of coffee, that's mm-hmm. when my brain starts to move, totally. and I'm like, and if I can just get stuff down, then hopefully I can work the rest of the day too. Right. Other times, but afternoon, it you know the phone rings. Who knows? Yeah. Right. Totally. So if at least I've had that time right you know so you do that you have a you have a system yeah i kind of a... get going right away and try to put you know a little time in immediately um, for like what two or two hours maybe yeah just, and, and usually well, when you say put time in you mean specifically creatively writing yeah or creating something. creating right my partner so you don't you don't look at your fucking email or no right. i mean you know i might check it and put it aside but i'm not uh-huh. answering you know right like but my partner's a nurse so like you know she has a pretty straight job she goes off to work and that's when it starts right and then you know by 11 30 or something or 11 it's kind of like all right <laughs> like and then think. and then things start then real life kind of creeps yeah, in right totally, you know and totally. i don't even have kids but like stuff right. happens the dog wants a walk whatever and you know that's that's when it that's when it <laughs> that's when it breaks down into like and i'd like to say on a good day i come back to it at some point but if if i get that at least I've got it. You know? But you, could, is it? Are you holding it as the ideal of what you would like to do with a day is create? Mm-hmm. Right. But but I also think that I have diminishing returns after a little. You know, yeah. if I put in two hours, then the third hour is usually not as great right. unless I take a break. You know, unless someone else is there too. If you're like, that's a huge thing, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I find that yeah, it's tough to to be. This whole thing is like self self generated right like self mode like it's and then you know i'm i'm pretty good at being like i don't want to do that today <laughs> and like you know i want to do that today when you go and like you know as far as other art books movies whatever other songs are there eras that you're drawn to you you, you mentioned cowboys earlier mm. is, is, is that a thing i like do you well, have anything like that you're like that's i like this i think sonically musically you mean or sure, anything, anything 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 you know i no i musically i definitely have like i think as much as i try to you know as much as i do broaden and i, and I, I love stuff i mean you know look i love stuff from all around mm-hmm. i do think there's a period sonically that's like late 70s early 80s and on into like you know maybe even late 80s where i feel like it was kind of like the the just a sort of it's it's crazy to me how good a lot of those records sound from that period you know i I mean it really is like i feel like people get people like to talk about how you know 60s and whatever like but i really feel like it's like late 70s early 80s is when it was like the pinnacle of that and then but i guess before digital i guess is what what changed it but yeah those records sound to me like a like a real a real period where that stuff but look as far as what's crazy or to me is that like what are we talking like from 1920 like uh, prior to 1920 which is 100 years ago yeah. right right now if you weren't in the room you didn't hear that music like right. you didn't it did it, simply you had to be physically present so this is crazy and all of humans we've only got a hundred years of recorded sure. shit like that is i get like a sick feeling when i think about that 
that's you know and like and we're and we're piecing apart like oh the 70s and the 80s it's like this is a joke like this is like it's only been possible for 100 years i don't I, that that just makes me feel insane you know what i mean like in the sense that also recording that, if you think about it that way, is a populist thing. Like, you know, like you don't have to be invited to the room. Right. You you can take this home and, and experience well, I, it on your own. Yeah, oh. yeah. But the, that's a, I guess, like the internet, obviously, is a thing that has shaped humans in our lifetime, right? Where we can see the, the direct result. But yeah, the very, like, the notion of putting on headphones and going by a walk by yourself and like immersing yourself in this sound is something that simply wasn't possible only a short time ago right so, and, but it's like it's an integral part of my life <laughs> you know what i mean like it's crazy to me that that i know that this is it's just you know it's technology and humans and all this but like something that integral to my life it feels wild to me is dependent on the, the you know, it's, it's like eating, you know what I mean? Like eating didn't require technology, you know what I mean? It's like, but this is something that feels as, as important, you know? And it's, it's just wild to me that it requires. I was talking to my niece who's young and she was telling me, she goes, I don't want to watch any old fashioned movies. And I said, <laughs> well, what would be like an old fashioned movie? And she like made a gesture, like she was picking up a phone and she said, hello, he's not here right now. <laughs> And it was like she doesn't want to watch a movie where there's a landline. Right. That was um, what. That was the. Yeah, she that's thought that was like, like just like that's terrible, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I, that made me feel. Dumb. That's funny. Yeah. My Get, kids have a thing where they say that. For I don't. I don't feel like we say this in our house, but at some point, my kids got the idea that when they want to say that something is is old and ridiculous, they go like, "It's like it's from the eighties." Like they say, like eight, like they say, like this big. And, and I'm like, when did you, the eighties, what's that? It's like, it's like, it's what? like big and bold and brash the and 80s. like ghostbusters. No, but that, they use it as like a, as a catch all for like old time, something old. It's like, it's from the eighties or something. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it hurts. Yeah. Yeah. That, that does. Getting back to Revelator, the new record, which by the way, I love the record. So good. Thank you. you know, you're talking about the revealing process about how, long into the the you know having all these songs sort of open or what like like how long into it it do you, did it reveal itself like how how mm. long was that part so it's been six years since say la vie right mm. like 2018 on paper but on it paper. was late 2018 and early yeah okay so like, but yeah, yeah and then but touring still, but still and then yeah, touring yeah, for and, it yeah yeah and so, a worldwide pandemic but, yeah right but no but fair enough like yeah I, to me though it, it's weird to see like six it's like dad it feels like it's only been a well we just months. said we hadn't seen each other in nine years so that's <laughs> yeah. i know about time flying. that seems at least a month ago yeah no i look it's been a minute i, I don't think i work quickly i don't i don't think i i think you like i i don't have your way of like i don't write that much i guess right. is what i'm saying when, yeah. when i write it's like like i don't have a backlog of you know a bunch of songs that don't get used are you are you recording right away like are you i record pretty early yeah so yeah. like you're 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 putting it on into like however you record it and messing with it yeah pretty early well overdubbing etc totally yeah because that's a huge part of it like yeah. i don't think i know what i'm doing until i can hear what i'm doing right and you want to so and and that goes crazy because you can get like i want to i want to hear it like in its final version sometimes before i know what the words are you know what i mean like that's right. what i want it never happens but that's what i want you know what i mean it's like so when you hear a thing back it's a start, but it's all, but it's like immediate, like oh well, this sounds like shit. You know what I mean? Like I gotta, I want, you know, I immediately get somewhere along the line. I remember having a conversation with you somewhere, and you were saying I was asking about mixing, and you were saying like, well, there's always kind of mixing going on. Yeah, totally. You know, because totally. you're you're mixing as you go. Somewhat, you're finding a place totally. for everything, which I think is 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 the uh, a big reason why these things I think take longer than you know. I've seen I've seen other bands you know or i've talked with engineers or i've been with engineers in the studio and they're, and they're talking about their other sessions and it's like they have a you know a thing of like okay all we gotta do is record bass record the drums record X. yeah cross it out you know what i mean and it's just that has never been my process yeah you know what i mean my process is like well let's record this on there and see what it sounds like and eh, that doesn't sound good let's record something else on, you know what i mean it's just it's literally just like 
you're going on a journey sort of totally yeah. i yeah. mean and 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 i guess technology or at least recording technology is part of it absolutely yeah yeah do you what do you have when you start i generally have well okay there's two ways it can happen the one way is i'm by myself and i just can start recording and i feel fine to record things that are definitely not songs yet you mm -hmm. know like real exploratory stuff and start you know can kind of layer that stuff and work work that way but if there's going to be other people involved the song has to be written like mm -hmm. i have to know what it is because I, I don't feel comfortable showing stuff in in progress i I, I would like to be more comfortable with that but i'm just not yet yeah uh, right. <laughs> so so at that point there's there if, if there's going to be so for revelator for example a, a, a couple of the tunes had been started in the way that i'm talking about where i had, had had kind of done all this stuff by myself and then kind of brought in people over to but the most of them were, were recorded in this four-day session where i brought in these people and i had the songs and we recorded them live in the room together you know with the hope that like some magic would happen that that wouldn't be like they you know we rolled tape on on like take one like you know having mm -hmm. showing them the song you know I mean, like let's roll tape you know what i mean not not rehearse at all you know and just like and i think and that and all those f like core things did end up being like i think there's a real special thing if you get lucky that happens that can't happen if you've rehearsed a bunch or whatever yeah. you know what i mean it's like you get this spark of everybody's like really playing with their heart and like or or their it's like it's like walking a tightrope or something you know, everybody's trying to and magic happens then and, and and it did happen in this case i think yeah i mean good musicians searching is like it's the best the most feeling beautiful. in the world yeah it's the best i mean it's my favorite part of this like because then of course there's going to be months and months of of whittling it down and making it better but in that moment it's my favorite part if if i could just do that and just move on which i think is kind of how people might have done it for a while like you know people were like full-on professionals they came in nailed it recorded that and then moved on to another thing right like mm -hmm. that was the record like i think you know but that isn't yeah yeah i mean when you're actually cutting doing takes it, it's amazing like like <laughs> how much of that part of the record you know because that in some cases that can be a lot of the record that all of a sudden you have you could have five songs in a day it's and you're like it only takes an hour right, <laughs> right. to make a record you can make a record in one hour yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, exactly. 45 minutes right yeah yeah revelator term that you know the immediate connotations are biblical and i think john the revelator is the author of revelations which is likely the most rock and roll or certainly the most metal book of the bible next song on the record is world the world is ending wild as heaven why does heaven comes a little later is this like coincidence or did you were you plugged into some sort of biblical or christian thing yeah no i worried about that and you've just confirmed my my worries that, that it would be it would be taken as that like it's i get it those are loaded words and i also get it that i am from the south and i live in nashville now and there's pedal steel over all my records but like <laughs> it sort of has all these sort of genre things that I, I don't think phosphorescent actually exists in that world mm -hmm. and i also and, and me personally i don't i don't um I, look i love flowery biblical language mm -hmm. um but yeah no n n it, none of that stuff really um is is maybe maybe i'm maybe i'm like being an interloper or something maybe i'm cheating on, you know what i mean but yeah i don't i'm especially in tune to it because i have lapsed catholic and mm -hmm. like think about this and mm -hmm. but i remember when i was an adult or when i was a kid i mean an adult said to me you know the thing about this church stuff is like it's just an easier way to talk to your about your to your kids about morality and stuff like mm -hmm. that if you send them mm -hmm. to sunday school they say like mm -hmm. thou shall not kill right mm -hmm. and it's like easier to do that than have those conversations with your kid is it though uh I, well or maybe a Maybe it's more levity. If it's like, dad says thou shall not kill, kind of lame, right? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, hopefully you. Hopefully that's assumed, thou shall not kill, right? 
Well, exactly. <laughs> That's so self-evident. I think that it's easier to just be self-evidently decent in this world. Whereas, well, shit, I guess we're doing it, I guess. But I, I have a real, like, I, I guess what I mean is my, I bristle at this, any association with that stuff, because I have a real, I have a real beef with religion. And right. Church. You know, right. I was raised, I was raised through it. And yeah, I mean, what, what, so it's easier to threaten children with eternal damnation <laughs> right, know, and give that kind of existential horror to them than to just be cool and just say like let's all be decent people like you know like <laughs> right so right this is all it, it can get pretty loaded for for me honestly and that's maybe why i i i, I don't know i i struggled with with calling it that because of because of those connotations but yeah but it, but it's here i mean you know it's, it's yeah look maybe i'm struggling with it in a way that i don't understand still i know i know how i've i know how i feel about it with my with my with my frontward facing brain my my backward you know my under under brain i don't i don't often know what it's doing you know when way back i think the time i met you was in 2010 i i hosted music coverage at south by southwest for ifc and i, I it was like the first time i ever did an interview and i i interviewed a ton of bands that week but the first one was phosphorescent oh that was, it was you really, yeah so it was the first I time that. i was ever on this side of the mic and oh, i also I remember go, like being like uh, like nervous and like i gotta do a good job because i've sat through dumb interviews and like did so much research and then like it was like okay your 15 minutes are up craig and i was like oh i have like four more pages you know like i'd done and then the rest i just want, uh, was kind of winging it but i the preparation there was anyways at that time i remember you know think thinking of a lot of questions about to willie your 2009 album of mm. willie nelson covers more recently you embarked you did the full moon project which you mm -hmm. covered a song for every full moon of a year right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. songs by randy newman lucinda williams nick Lowe, bob dylan does diving into those songs and like wrapping your head around them does it does it affect your own songwriting and is that an intention or is it yeah it is maybe not so much as writing but but definitely in terms of the making of the music and the sounds i think you dig into writing also happens where you where you it's okay again it's two things like i think when you when you learn when you you think you know a piece of music someone's song you're like oh yeah i know that but then when you if you take the time to actually like really you know you're going to do a version of it all of a sudden you're like well i didn't realize that masterful turn of phrase or that like or very specifically musically you know you're like holy shit did you see that like i didn't know that happened like it just happened you know you just and i think so yeah like i learn a lot and i think my excitement with that stuff is is more about learning about honestly to, to have a a platform to work on music that isn't burdened with a phosphorescent like you know making a phosphorescent record or even writing a song that i know is going to eventually be phosphorescent you know has a lot of just personal like oh like now i gotta record it and now i gotta <laughs> yeah you know you and, just and worry, people are gonna you hear know? it and, and have an opinion on <laughs> yeah, it right yeah yeah you're, yeah you know but like a rolling stone that that's, just, that's, that's that people have an opinion and that's he already he already handled that fun. i get to just yeah it's just fun to sing it yeah is there any any song on the like the full moon session that that surprised you and so is there any one in particular that you kind of thought whoa well like a rolling stone actually would have been yeah. the when the one that i in in all seriousness like we didn't i had zero intention of recording that song but i was setting up the the world sir for scott who who, who plays uh, keyboard scott stapleton to record i think probably on one of the other ones or i know on one of those i can't remember which one actually but he he'd come over that night to to record on on another one and while i was setting up the mic and he was dinking around all of a sudden we were you know it just sounded like he'd hit rolling stone and he was like how's it feel yeah, you know yeah. we're just goofing and then all of a sudden it was like wait let's let's hit it you know what i mean just hit record and like go for it and what a staggering tune that is obviously uh, i mean everyone, yes everyone obviously but, but, but it's it's it was written and recorded before you or i were born so there is in that because of that a, a tendency to take it for granted exactly and i, well, I, I think we take for granted songs even now you know all the time like like i think especially when something becomes that sort of ubiquitous it's just like it's like the air it's just there i mean you're like yeah to imagine I, I, it gets emotional to me, honestly. Like I think of Bob Dylan, who's what probably twenty three or twenty four at that time, yeah. with like such a crazy burden. Like no one has that thing. Like what a like what a lonely and 
wild position that he was in. Do you know what I mean? And wrote this angry, beautiful, like it's, I just, I'm like, I want to hug that guy. You know, like, I want to like, <laughs> man, I fucking love that song. I had the same, I, when I went and saw uh, Springsteen on Broadway that, you know, he did Born to Run. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I, I had an emotional moment. I may have teared up because I was yeah. like, at some point there was no Born to Run. Right. And then he sat down at a piano or a guitar or whatever it was and said, there's going to be a born to run. And, you know, we now just, yeah. we hear it. And it's born to run. It's, I love and, that and, stuff. And, and, and it's, it's, it's fascinating, you know, but there, there was, there's a lot of stuff on like a Rolling Stone when it, I don't know, there's some anniversary and people talked about hearing that song mm -hmm. in 1960, what, mm -hmm. five, five, five. And how like Technicolor and you know like like it was just like like yeah. oh my god and it 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 yeah. was a game changer. I mean it didn't yeah exactly it didn't exist before. Yeah, I, I had the same thing. I remember like when I was a kid and seeing like Led Zeppelin a video of Led Zeppelin mm -hmm. playing like and it, you realize you know Robert Plant's a singer singer so it's a three piece band. It's, it's and you're like, that stuff is so wild. How how big what? that sounds? Yeah yeah and you're like I thought this just it descended from Rock Mountain. But it's actually musicians playing together. Just dudes. Yeah. It's just some. It's just some dudes. Three. Three people <laughs> are doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's really tremendous. Uh, yeah. That stuff is. Uh, yeah. I can. I can go there all day. How about the moon cycles? Was that? <laughs> did, was that just a way to organize it, or is that something that you're in touch with? Yeah. I, I, look, I'm. I'm not as in touch with it as it might sound from doing a thing like that. But yeah, I mean, it definitely was when I was walking around again. Oh yeah, with headphones. I was in Key West, Florida. Like it was uh, at the tail end of the pandemic. Like it was my first show to be like, or first reason to be traveling again. And like I played a solo show down there and I was walking with some headphones and it was a full moon. And I was listening to Bob Dylan. <laughs> the, the The final song that I did on, on that series is called trying to get to heaven. And that was the, like, that was the sort of spark of it. And I was just looking at the moon and I was thinking, I wanted to, like, I was like, I'm going to record this song. Cause it was the, one of those times where I don't know how you do it, but when I get into a song, and it's like, that's a song I knew. I knew that. I knew that album. I, I don't know why that evening I was walking with Time Out of Mind playing, it's, but I was. And it's like, I knew that song, but then all of a sudden it just leaps out of a thing. And then I have a tendency to just burn it down. Like, I probably listened to it 50 times then. You know what I mean? Like, I will ruin it. You know what I, mean? I just go, do it again, do it again, do it again. And like, kind of like, and so during that thing, I, and I stayed up, you know, till dawn, actually, there were other things going on too, but I, you know, I was a huge part of it was that tune. And yeah, I just kind of realized I wanted to record a lot of these tunes that have meant the world to me and find a way to do that. And I mean, it was just like, ah, oh, maybe like once a month seems about right. And then the moon, yeah, it was just kind of like that. Are you in touch with like moon no. stuff? And no, no, no. <laughs> in fact, every time that I see the full moon, it kind of shocks me. Totally. Yeah. Like, like there's I'm, again. Yeah. I'm not, I, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm whatever the opposite of it is. It, right. it's, I'm not, I'm not in touch with it. Right. I don't know. I don't even know the words like, you know, retrograde, all that. Yeah, like, yeah. But I learned a lot about it, to be honest, doing this thing. Yeah. <laughs> so whenever I have someone, one of my, and this is the sort of the last thing I've got is when I have people on this podcast and they have a song that has done especially well. I'm always interested in kind of their memory of it. And song, song for Zula from Muchacho, massive song. It's like a modern classic. I still hear it at restaurants, bars, all that. When you, you know, mix that song, when, when, it, when it got done, were you like, this is going to happen or did it surprise you? absolute surprise yeah. did you did you know it was it the single on the record probably right it was, yeah, yeah. But, so you knew it was one to push forward but you didn't i actually didn't oh yeah I, I really didn't i i i no i really did i mean look i have a maybe a naivety or something about this but i think that at the especially at the time of finishing a record i think i think that all of them are fucking classics you know like <laughs> i love them all and it was 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 definitely one of those but but yeah i i i thought it was maybe the i mean it is still probably the heaviest song on that record i didn't think that i certainly wouldn't have thought it would be one for like if we're calling that mass appeal or whatever like yeah i wouldn't have thought that would be one that a lot of people would gravitate towards because i even think it's really a heavy song 
It is. It, it's heavy, but maybe, yeah. But maybe the heaviness is, it's it's heaviness that connects. You know? Uh, yeah. I, I yeah, think I that's, right. that's my interpretation. <laughs> as, as I didn't write it, yeah. but like, I'm sitting there being like, this is heavy and it's moving to me. Will you tell me, like, I don't know if you know, you know, how much phosphorus and stuff you know, but I mean, does it seem to leap out of the, of the body of work as a, as an I exceptionally am, different song? No, what? actually, okay. no. I, and I know <laughs> all of it from the record with it's hard to be humble hmm. from that on. I know all of it oh, cool. and it's, it's, it's in the catalog. But that said, when people started like, really, when it started going, not, hmm. you know, then I was like, Oh, I get it. Like, okay. I think people are, it, it's, it's a beautiful song and it, and, yeah. it, and it has a levity to it, but I like it all. And I'm tend to be the guy who doesn't like the hit, you know that, what I mean? Me like, too, actually. Yeah. That's yeah. my, my instinct is to like the, the weird one. Do you think that's on something. purpose or do you think that you, cause I'm the same on any given like artists work inevitably, like the major popular one is my least favorite tune of theirs. You know, yeah, it's, it, it's not necessarily my. Least, I, I'm. I know my own devices is to not write choruses. Right. So I. I think like anything that sort of doesn't repeat or, it's not that it the repetition I don't like. It's like I always feel like like I love songs like when they go to the actual chorus part but mm. there's new words totally because i feel like i'm getting even more information totally. <laughs> yeah you know yeah, like, like, weird. I, I know it's you mean. like oh you already said that mm -hmm. you know and it, sometimes it feels like in pop music especially it feels like when it goes to the commercial it's like when the tv show goes to the commercial mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it's like we had the content and then you, now we mm -hmm. have the the the, the slow the message or what yeah 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 and i totally yeah so that's that. All right. So one more, and we're going to wrap this up. Do you think you, you've lived in a number of places? Athens, Alabama is where you're from, right? New York. I've known you when you're here. Now you're in Nashville. Has traveling changed your music or not traveling, but well, traveling too, because you travel on tour, but moves. I don't know that. I wonder, I don't, I don't know. I think, yeah, no, look, it had to, have. it has to have. For sure. The sound of stuff has been influenced by where I was living at that time, I think you can, I mean, especially in the early times, like in the larger sense, I guess what I mean is no, because again, there's this front brain, back brain thing that happens where I think you're affected by stuff that, or, or at least I'm slow to realize what's happening until later, you know, like I don't, I don't, I feel like the space that I get in to make these songs is extremely walled in and i feel like the songs would exist no matter what was happening as far as like how they exist in the world after that i do think obviously so much affects it and 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 i'm also probably wrong about that first part is that i think i'm probably being affected by stuff all the time you know like i say i'm slow to i'm slow to to realize it but i do think that like the place that i that i write from tends to be for better or worse like a sort of walled off like fortress or something that do you know what i mean it, like i feel very alone and protective in there like and so yeah in that in that sense you know but you, you're bound by the by the by the things that are your you know there's a reason that when i was in athens georgia there's horns all over those records it's like a you know hornsy town and for sure but at the same time it's like i think probably the most country sounding record I've made is, was probably in New York. And then, you know, I don't know. I, that stuff is all very, I don't know. Do you, do you think about that stuff? Like, do you, do you feel like you're affected by, or do you think you'd make the same records wherever you were? I think I'd like to think I'd make the same records. I don't, you know, I don't know. Yeah, um, I know, right? I, I think that I tend to have a gaze backwards. So I think like I started writing a lot about Minneapolis after I moved to New York. So, so I could see what was unique. So there about you write your Minneapolis records. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, but now I've been in New York so long, I can only I can just write like my early New York records. Right, right. <laughs> so that's far enough away. Yeah. No, I think you're right about that. I think that's very true. Is that I do the same thing. Yeah, you end up writing. Yeah, I write backwards as well for sure. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Thanks, man. Craig. Writing backwards, relying on our memories. That's what we talk about here, and it was such a pleasure to talk about this with Matthew. Go see the band Phosphorescent on tour this summer. They're playing a ton of dates. Check out the new record, Revelator. It's really great. 
phosphorescentmusic.com for the dates. I'm also going to be around. I'll be out with the Hold Steady, Melbourne, Australia, Seattle, D.C., Evanston, Illinois, Milwaukee, St. Paul, Denver, Atlanta. Check out all our dates on theholdsteady.net. And we've got a ton of great guests coming up here every other week now. Stay tuned for more. Listen and subscribe. A huge thanks to you for listening. I'm Craig Finn, and that's how I remember.